I'm Ann Smith, and I'm here again with my guest, Anthony Bazia, uh, my fellow co-founder of Project Bazia and a fairly new nonprofit called Africans United. And we want to continue our conversation about um, Bazia's homeland, uh, South Sudan. And the CPA, which is the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, the anniversary of that is coming up this year. It will be the 10th anniversary. And um, Bazia, as a native of that country, is, is quite concerned that um, although there was a huge celebration when the division of the North and the South took place, there has not been any follow-up um, celebration since. And, and we've both looked at this problem and wondered, well, you know, why is this so? Um, people celebrate usually because they're really happy something happened. And, and on, the, on the day of the CPA, the first CPA uh, official date, uh, you were there. Uh, again, I'd like you to tell me just a little bit about what was going on. What were people doing and, and how were they acting? I think one of the things I almost describe it by, if you have a heavy thing in your head and you drop it down, that was a big uh, happiness for them. But I've well, I've seen pictures. Yeah, but I think there was not enough leisure to think about what's the next move. Right. South Sudan. Mm -hmm. But the CPA agreement of voting ninety eight to make South Sudan ninety eight percent, ninety eight point nine percent. Yeah, yeah, that's a big number. So the people got what they wanted, uh, but again, um, as you and I have talked about many times, this was a group of people who had never really um, been an official part of any governmental system, uh, you know, other than the tribal level. And the tribal level, from what I've been able to learn from my time now spent with refugee families from all over Africa, is more like a big family. Together. Yeah. yeah, with one leader, he's sort of the papa. Uh, and he makes most of the decisions. He has uh, elder relatives yeah, who advise yeah. him. Uh, but uh, you don't have elections to choose the chief of the tribe, do you? Uh, no. Uh, sometimes through the family, just a technical, the father, the grandpa, like just me, from my grandpa to my daddy to me, it became part of the family. It's, there's no voting, in other way. All right. I do know there are countries in Africa where there is a selection process, and uh, but I don't want to get into that right here. In general, a, a tribe is more like a big extended family, and it, it's not that big. Everybody knows who the people of power are. Uh, you, they don't get written about in the newspaper, but everybody knows them personally because they've had some kind of contact with them at some point. Yes, you know, um, I'm going to do a little aside here. For example, I know one thing that interested me that your father did, um, young men and women could go to him, right? Oh. And uh, they would stay in your house. Uh, and in fact, you often found when you went to bed at night, your bed was already occupied by a tribal guest. Yep. Nobody said, Bazia, do you mind if I sleep in your room? They just, they were there, they right? They took over. And, and while they were there, and how long did they stay with your family during this time? We almost believe, give them 30, uh, 90 days. Just Three months. Yeah, to understand the system, because Khartoum was the capital, and then they came from the village. They are not really familiar with uh, traffic and sometimes ID. It in, includes a lot of stuff. Okay. And if you look at it, my dad was offered two choices of uh, maybe get back to school or maybe have a job. And he's still going to go back to that background, what they done before. So that 90 days was a little bit better to give them a little better understanding. Okay, and he would talk with them during this time and explain to them what kinds of things, the things they were totally unfamiliar with. That's correct. You know, and, and I think that's a key part of the other subject, the bigger subject we're concerned with, is that a large number of people who live in Africa live in these small villages. They have never seen a traffic jam. They may not have ever had any experience with indoor plumbing or electricity or um, 
even a system other than what they know immediately around them in the what village. Uh, and I will add something that I learned, particularly from talking to uh, other Africans. One man said to me one day, in an African village, if you see a child running, everybody stops to see why is that child running. In other words, everyone in the village feels a sense of responsibility for the other people around them. I mean, that's a very strong, tight-knit community. But you take someone from that environment and you bring him to the city where there are laws and governments and, and, and police and all kinds of organizations he has no contact with, he's it's lost. Different. Different. Yeah, he's more th it's more than different. Um, so I think when we, again, I've seen the pictures of the celebration of the CPA. I've seen people leaping and screaming and waving the South Sudanese flag because, like you said, they felt like a great burden had been lifted. Yep. But now what's next is something they have no idea of what to do. Who was the person they were planning on having who would have solved all their problems once the CPA went into effect? Who did they expect to lead them? Who was going to be the tribal leader for the whole country? I mean, John Grant can be a good example. He was a man who had a big image. And, uh, and I'll let's back up and, and again for our non-South Sudanese audience, tell them who was John Garang? What did he do? Yeah, John Grant was more educated. He studied in, even in the United States, but he was a military commander of, through the military captain. Okay, from, for the SPLA. For the SPLA, and even he was one of the high level in education and the military of Sudan, when Sudan was a country. Ah. Yeah, Grant uh, studied about farming, and he had... Uh, Where did he do that? He started in uh, Sudan, and he went to Khartoum, because everything down, and then he came to the master in the United States of Iowa. Okay. Yeah, he was more educated, and he was more uh, to the leadership. And even him name, he mean a lot in Dinka tribe. And, and why would that matter? Uh, any tribe have a call. If you see, example, like Baria, if there's a fifth child, there's a name for that fifth child. There's a second child, there's a name. So different tribe have a different uh, way to look at the fifth child, out the name. Because uh, African in general, way, they have their own name, and at the same time, even they like other famous people. So all these give Garang more uh, way to look at him of a leader in the community. Because if you go back to, I can just give example to the Denka tribe, leader, they have three levels of leader. Uh, John Garang was one of the people who born have a gift. And when he get that gift and plus education, he became willing to do more. Uh, the other leader in, in Dinka tribe, there is one who he would get married, and his house is open to the people. That's the second. There's a third one who will go through the channel of education and get that education done and be a leader. So they have different level of the leadership. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so not everybody goes and does all three of those things. Right. It's everybody can have different... You specialize. So yeah, you specialize one of okay. those. So you go to other tribes, like if you go to me, I'm a Lua, you have a different way to look at us. Like us, we, we never marry the man ourselves because we believe the blood will affect the family. You don't want to be too closely right. related to your wife. Right. So you go to the Inca tribe, they married close. You go to other. So there's a lot of stuff similar, but they have a benefit of different things. Like and us, we don't believe in a group. We believe in dependent. One person, one of the things, you need to get your good education, good skill. The other group believe in the big group. So I think that's one of the other challenges, too. Uh, and, and I think, too, uh, the Dinkas are nomads. They don't stay in one place. They're moving according to the weather. And uh, I think the other main, main problem, and I wish if they start thinking about it, if you raise an animal, you need to think about the farming. Why well, I say that, I grew up in Philly, and I grew up with the Amish. Amish was not raising animal on behalf of the ways that are taking animal 
moving around. So if the grass in one guy's farm was gone, they didn't. He didn't go to the next farm and take all his grass, right? No, they they they, they raise uh, food for the cow different level uh, according to yeah. even the horse eat different of the cow, mm -hmm. our goat. All these animals have different take of uh, when you talk about food who concern them. Yeah. So Amish try to prepare those different animals under them, even on top of that they have chicken. Yep. You can't bring a grass to the, chi to the chicken to eat. No, no, no chickens so, don't eat grass. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to, to give example like they can other tribe of South Sudan who raise all animals. And I think that's the other issue between the Dinka tribe and the farming people like Fertit and Abba. Now I'm gonna briefly explain again for our non South Sudanese audience. Um, there are tribes that are known by their name, like the Dinka, the Nuer, the Shiluk, the Zandi, and, and, and they pretty much could be divided into two groups. Um, those who raise uh, animals, pastoralists, herds, and they go from place to place. They don't have, they have a permanent settlement for six months of the year, but then they go to another one. Okay, that's one group, and they're a huge portion of the population, uh, probably more than half. The other group um, are for the prim primarily um, farmers, okay? And what's interesting, I know, happen to know from the research I did for one of our books, is that the Zandi tribe, who are in the south, they are farmers almost exclusively, and there's a funny reason why they are. They had serious problems with malaria and malaria began to, they were once pastoralists. They had cows, primarily. And then along came an epidemic of malaria, which doesn't just affect humans, it affects cattle as well, along with the tsetse fly, the sleeping sickness, and they lost all of their cattle. They had to find a new way to survive. But when you think that they were people whom, again, they were nomads at that point. They moved all over the place because the cows eat a lot. And they didn't have the practice of raising hay and alfalfa and all that stuff. So, so at some point in their evolution as a tribe, and it was probably hundreds of years ago, they switched to farming and it became their practical solution. But it also completely changed their lifestyle, their way of looking at the world. So now you have a country where again, as I said, at least half the people are living in a lifestyle that no one else in the world practices except um, a few people like uh, in Mongolia, there are herdsmen. I believe in some of the Arab countries, there are still herders. But this is a lifestyle that it's obsolete in the modern world. You know, even in Texas, we don't let our range animals run all over the place from farm to farm eating all the produce that they're growing for the supermarkets, right? So that, that was a problem. But Garang, getting back to letting you speak, sorry, Garang was raised in that tribe. Yeah, he, he was a pastoralist. Yeah, he was more open mind, and you have better chance in the level of him family, and then even get a better education. And one of the other credit I'll give Garang uh, to start about farming, it gave me a different way to look at him. And and, and this is one of the things, if he was still in the life, the military of South Sudan, I don't want to say, before the movement was Ispela, but since you become a country, you became to be a military. He was thinking military have to be doing a farming. And he was one of the people, he doesn't accept getting the food through UN or other organizations. Oh, he didn't want to be a charity case. Yeah, so I think the man have more credit, and maybe some people was around him, they never learned much to take over in a better way. Because for me, I look at it, if you don't have a chance with John Garang was when he was in Khartoum, but this 21 year or 22 until he came to the power and he died, somebody's supposed to be learn something for this man. Yeah. Somebody's supposed to be willing, even if he can be die in the process in the, in the name of John Garang, he would make a point about what he is. 
Now we just celebrate about him. We almost just place him here. But he has something to offer, but nobody today really willing to stand up and say, you know what, I want to be the legacy of this man. Even if I'm going to die in the process, I feel the 21 year, even regarding it was the movement of South Sudan. But I believe this man has a lot to offer. But I wish somebody. And, and he was killed. He was killed. And, and I think we should mention in passing that um, there, I know from talking to other South Sudanese. How did, how did he die, first of all, just the bare facts? According to the uh, taking place, since he was the vice president of Sudan. At that point, he was vice president Sudan, of Sudan. He, he take a helicopter or a plane to Uganda, official uh, visit, I can say. Yep. And arrived there, and then again, he have to be look around Uganda and other mission through his mission. So he was well known to other leaders. Right. So um, we just, I was just in, uh, I believe I was in Philly that time, and I was just hang out with my couple of friends of mine, and the news came around. In the United States, it was the evening, and somebody called me to see there's a bad news. I was like, what do you mean, bad news? They said there was a helicopter, and John Graham was on it, oh, and I have a crash. So um, when you, you say crash of the plane or car, that's mean accident. But I don't know how that accident take place. I don't have access uh, to the Sudan government, because all my life I'm outside Sudan, and, and today I'm not even com complaining of Think I'm not there, and and it's hard. But I can go by the news would say. The, the information who came out is a accident, a crash, and that's why it take place. And there are stories. Yeah. There are stories. The black box it for the good. helicopter was, was found, found, and that there was nothing wrong with the helicopter. And I believe the stories I've read, the newspaper accounts say that the there was some kind of weather problem. Right, yeah. And the helicopter crashed into, uh, is it Imatang? Imatang, uh, it, the, mountain. Which is a, one, it's the one big mountain in South Sudan, yeah. which I think makes me start to say, wait a minute, how can you hit the one mountain uh, if there's only one mountain? <laughs> but so there's a lot of mystery. The bottom line is, though, Garang is gone. It's gone. But that's one thing I'm, I'm trying to just say. We can talk about what happened to him, but. I'm just feeling the man have a lot to offer, not always in the yeah. level of Sudan. Yeah. Let's just remember the, the story in the beginning, because the man was fighting in the name of Sudan and the name of the Africa. And I'll give him a credit, because look at him movement, him background of education, done school in Sudan, went to the United States, studied in Iowa. All this is not an accident. The man have a lot to offer. But to just go like that, and I wish one of the day that somebody going to come somewhere and somehow. That's my hope. And figure out. But again, in the, in the long run, it makes no difference. He's gone. But he had people connected to him. Uh, you referred to them once to me as, as the, John Garang's gang, the people who, who knew about his dreams, that he shared his ideas with. Um, you mentioned somebody named, I believe, yeah, Wanigo. Fagan, Fagan, Fagan and John Gar uh, Fagan, uh, Wanigo. They used to call them uh, the boys of John Garang. Okay, John Garang's boys. The reason boys. why they say call them John Garang boys, especially Fagan Amun, until today everybody believe he was those people, even uh, Riyak Mashar, all these other leaders that was very close to John Garang. And sometimes in, in the way they put it, uh, they are boys of John Garang. But I, like his gang. Yeah, yeah but he, I, I hope, and I never, I was suspecting, me, my person, I'm not saying what I'm expecting, everybody have to agree with me. I was suspecting if one of those boys who was close to him, and until today fighting to keep him in it, maybe he was balancing some stuff to, the, to save other people's life. Because since South Sudan get dependent, celebrate one time or two times, if I remember correctly, and now we're here to talking about 10 years after the defender. But I can guarantee you this more than eight years, there's no celebration. The only the last one we did last year was the soccer game, but it was not bad. I can thank you for myself. We try to do something according to what is going on with homeland in a different country in the United States. But I'm still fighting to ask myself and to ask my people of South Sudan and people who care about South Sudan, what is wrong about us? And 
who is going to say? Because the majority of the people in South Sudan are, even though the government has changed and everything is different in some ways, nothing has changed. The, the people are still living to a large extent. Some of them are herding cows. Some of them are having farms. And some of them are living in small villages. Um, there hasn't been an awful lot of progress or movement towards a more modern way of life. But at the same time, I don't get the feeling that anybody chose to, you know what I'm saying? It's not like somebody said, oh, well, we're just going to keep everything just the way it is. Uh, other than, but, but that's what's happened. Things haven't changed except for one thing. There's some money trickling into the government from the oil. Yeah, um, I will go back to one thing very important. I know what you just said is very important. But I think, until today, I think some other countries of Africa, they struggle about asking themselves, who's the next leader? You, everybody in the community, they are leader. But I don't understand why they almost point the finger to the other side. And, and this is a message direct to the South Sudanese, if it's in diaspora, if it's in South Sudan. If you have lived in your own house, your husband and your kids, and, and I can give an example of John, uh, Bob Marlin, he used to sing. He said, if you have a problem in your house, or even if you don't have, but your neighborhood have a problem, you don't say something, tomorrow it came to you. And I think South Sudanese, they got to stop worrying about outside before they have to look at themselves. This 64 tribe, what is wrong about us? And because the North say before, South Sudanese, they cannot be running them life, or they cannot be leader to be a nation. And now they, what the North said is happened. Yeah, yeah. So my concern for my brother and my sister, I will just say one thing, the blood is enough. There is no nation in this world. You're going to tell me you're going to fight and kill your brother, whatever the reason. But in the end of the day, it will end. There have to be peace. Yep. And forgiveness. And the true peace, not fake peace. Because since we became a nation, many agreements, many leaders. But I don't think they don't see the reason. I don't mind you want to be a leader. But if there's no peace and security and love and respect, we're never going to go nowhere. And, and, and that brings me back again. I mean, 63, 64, or 65, no matter how you count the tribes, um, there are a number of smaller tribes, and I've looked at the list, who have a similar lifestyle. They farm. They do business. They tend to be stationary in one place. and. Uh, They've actually always worked together, and I believe they're called the Fertit or Fertit. Fertit tribe. Okay. Um, like 26 tribes. 26 tribes out yeah. of the 63 or 64. Yeah. That's, that's a lot of groups of people. And they've learned, obviously, from uniting and working together one very important thing. If you do that, you have more strength. You have more security. Uh, by the way, the name Fertit comes from the British. The British used to call them the fruit people right, yeah. because they were farmers and they raised lots of fruit in their orchards, mangoes and things like that. Sometimes I think I'd like to go to South Sudan just to go out the wind door and help myself to a fresh mango off the tree. Um, but anyway, the Fer Fertit have already learned this. Uh, and the Fertit as a group, I believe, are not just united in South Sudan, but there are groups of Fertit around the world in diaspora. And they've already seen the benefits of working together. Something like what you and I were talking about on the last show, the benefits of having an organization called Africans United, so that even if there are only five people from, say, Malawi living in Portland, they can work with the 3,000 Congolese who are here and everyone get the same benefits. And it doesn't come down to, oh, I don't want to work with you because I'm from Malawi and I don't want to work with you because I'm Congolese. It's the same thing in your country. It's, it's the same idea. Um, can diaspora 
communicate well enough. Diaspora is the community that's left and is successful in other parts of the world. Can the people in diaspora have an influence on what happens back in South Sudan? Uh, yeah, they can have a, a, a better understanding. But it's still, I, I believe, they have to engage with the people uh, back home. But the other problem, in my understanding, in, in, is affecting South Sudan in general, uh, the number of the people who are poor. And I think that's flecked to the interests. Poor, you mean in the in diaspora or? Back home Pacific. Back home Pacific. In South Sudan. Yeah. And, and if you're hungry, you're going to find a way to eat. That's right. And if, if Bazir coming was a good idea, but he doesn't give you something, but maybe somebody else will give somebody else something be better than Bazir. But, but again, and you and I have talked about this before, the people who are in diaspora are living, name a country, there are South Sudanese people living there. Canada, Australia, the United States, UK, right? France, Russia, all, around, all, all around. everywhere. Even even Japan and China, places you wouldn't expect. Yeah, even, to, uh, Vietnamese. Okay, you wouldn't expect to find uh, South, Af Sudanese. South Sudanese oh, there, but they're there because they had to go somewhere. They have seen another way to live, live. and they have raised their children in a country where there is another way to live. So they've had a lot of time. I mean, I will say one thing. Most South Sudanese I've met are extremely intelligent people. They're very observant, and they look around and they go, ah, I don't like this, I don't like this. Oh, I do like that, okay? So what is wrong with them? I mean, we finally live in a world where I can talk to somebody in Bangkok every day for practically nothing, Th right? Through WhatsApp yep. or Messenger, and we can exchange ideas. Or in Toronto, or in Sydney, you know, just name a place. That's correct. I, I can contact them, I can uh, share my, it, I, I take this law, uh, to a higher level, but yeah, I find myself wondering why we have any problems at all, when it's so easy to communicate with people just about anywhere. So, I think our show is going to continue. We're going to have guests from other countries. Um, we're going to focus for a while on South Sudan. We intend to invite people from different tribes to give more information about what it is like. Um, I know you said the solution in Rwanda was to simply not talk about the tribes, but I think tribalism is so much a part of South Sudanese culture that an education about tribes and tribalism is possible. Uh, before I say goodbye today, I want to recommend a book that we didn't write. Uh, this was written by Desmond Tutu and his daughter. It is called The Book of Forgiving. If no matter what ethnicity you are or what country you're from, what your religion, this is a really fine book that helps you understand what is needed for people to stop fighting and forgive each other. I want to thank my guest. I know we'll be back. And I want to thank my audience for listening. And you can always contact us through Project Basia. Thank you. Many, many. Oh, 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 oh,